Hello and welcome to another episode of Blurble Reasoning. Today we're going to be talking about my first ever full read-through of Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien. I always say Tolkien, I get the impression that I'm supposed to say Tolkien, I will inevitably slip back into saying Tolkien. Now before we start talking about the story proper, let's start talking about context, background. What is my history with the Lord of the Rings? I mean, I don't need to give you my entire life story, uh, but the gist of it is I read The Hobbit. Ooh. Wow, I put too much <laughs> emphasis on the H. <laughs> Sorry, I read The Hobbit back in 2020 via Audible, and I actually have a video on this channel. I have the very first blurble reasoning I believe I ever did was on that book. I don't think it's a very good one, but if you want to go back and listen to my impressions on that, that is available. I was listening to the Rob Inglis version because that was the version that Audible had front and centre back then, uh, whereas with Fellowship of the Ring I went with Andy Circus because he has recorded his version since then, and you got to go with the voice of Gollum if you're going to listen to an audible narration, right? Also, he's just really bloody good. We'll get into that in a minute. But as far as Lord of the Rings goes, the general story, the movies, etc., it's kind of been a hole in my pop culture knowledge, which is hilarious, seeing as I'm a big fan of fantasy. So, you know, when I was a teenager slash young adult slash early 20s, I read A Song of Ice and Fire in uni, um, and then I've just finished reading The Wheel of Time as well. Um, that took me three and a half years. I've got a whole video series about that on the channel. And when looking ahead to the rest of the fantasy genre and where I want to go next, I thought I should probably go back and read Lord of the Rings. That's probably something I should go and do. I had given Fellowship of the Ring a fair shot uh, before on Kindle, but I got to Tom Bombadil and gave up. Lord of the Rings, uh, the writing, the prose, as far as it's aged and stuff, it's not impenetrable, but it is definitely a little dry in places, and people have said as much in the past. But as far as, like, do I know the story already, as far as the movies go, I've seen Fellowship of the Ring, I think, twice. Uh, I've seen Two Towers once, and I've never seen the final movie of Lord of the Rings. I technically don't know how the story ends, but given how everyone assumes that everyone already knows, I pretty much know how the story ends. It may seem weird that I've seen the first two Lord of the Rings movies, but never the final one. Uh, it's honestly because I could just never muster the will to... W I mean, I'm not a movies guy anyway, but like... I've always said, like, it's just the one where they win. Like, I, I was interested in the first few movies because I could get to know the world of the characters, some of the memes, uh, that kind of thing. But when I got a taste for it, I was like, yeah, this is good, but I already know where this is going. And so while I never avoided watching the third movie, I was never, like, incentivized to do so, if you know what I mean. But I've recently seen the merit for reading the books for the sake of reading the books, even if I know how it ends, or at least I think I know how it ends. If I know the general gist of how it goes, there's still a lot to be enjoyed and gleaned from reading the books for myself. Or having them read to me by Andy Serkis, you know. Also, I just want to say I know this is an incredibly famous book, and I don't really know what I can add to the conversation around it that hasn't already been said, um, but I'm not exactly going to get into super literary critical, you know, conversations about uh, World War One or post-World War One Europe and how that's seen in the text and etc, etc. I'm just here to share my reaction to the book. If I'd read the series multiple times, I would probably be approaching it from a new angle each time, like, hey, I want to see how Tolkien addresses this. But the man himself wrote a foreword to this book, and he is against allegory in all its forms. And he, this book is definitely just about elves and orcs and stuff, not about World War II, so don't even go thinking that he's talking about World War II. And to that I say, uh, no story is created in a vacuum, Mr. Tolkien and I respect that maybe you're not aiming for metaphors and allegory, but you, you certainly might have accidentally dinged it a few times on the way. Anyway, the story itself, uh, let's begin with that. <laughs> I say let's begin with that four minutes in, classic YouTuber. I do find the first half of this book to be quite slow going. Someone literally recommended me to skip to chapter 10, where we meet Strider, uh, if I'd seen the movie at least, because I would know a lot of the stuff that the book sets up for the first nine chapters. I decided to go against that advice just because I'm I'm quite completionist in terms of, you know, stories and knowing the ins and outs of each part of it. That did mean sitting through a whole lot of rambling about hobbits and 
uh, Hobbiton and Bag End and how everyone feels about each other and the gossiping that goes on between the different families, etc. Which I didn't entirely dislike, it, and I didn't, you know, I, it wasn't unexpected either. It was just obviously a little slow. But, you know, I was getting a feel for the world. I was trying to figure out the lore. Whenever I read a new fantasy series, I put the map of the fantasy world up as my background. Um, I did that for the Wheel of Time, so I had that on, as my PC background for three and a half years. Now I've got Middle Earth as my background, and it's a nice change of pace. Mostly because this map looks more well made. <laughs> no shade on the Wheel of Time, but it does not have the best artistic assets at least not in an official capacity. There's a world book for the Wheel of Time that I've recently learned is uh, called among fans the Big White Book of Bad Art, and having looked at some of those preview pages, yeah, I can see that. But yes, this is a sequel to The Hobbit, uh, which is fun. It's fin it's, I always thought The Hobbit was written later, after Lord of the Rings, and it was like a prequel deal. He was like, I'll go back and flesh out Bilbo's story. But um, I don't know when I got that corrected, probably back when I first read The Hobbit in 2020. But it is fun to see the world evolve the maturity of it as well kind of evolve this is no longer a children's book uh it's got some i wouldn't say more adult themes but it's definitely got some darker themes such as the weight of the burden of carrying the ring and you know avarice and corruption um and how the best intentions can lead down dark roads etc hi boromir how you doing we'll get to you in a bit but yeah the first part of the book is largely concerned with the hobbits trying to make their way on their adventure um, at least when we get to that point, <laughs> and it's uh, obviously Frodo and Sam and Pippin and Merry, and they just keep almost dying. It's actually quite funny how often they almost die. They're innocent and naive and inexperienced and one might even say incompetent, and it's wild that Gandalf was just like, I mean, to be fair, they were supposed to wait for Gandalf and he didn't show up, so that's why they went without him. But it's wild well, that he was like, I'll meet you in Bree if, if I don't turn up, like, trusting them to get to Bree, given all the things that happened to them. If it wasn't for good old Tom Bombadil, uh, <laughs> they would be dead, crushed by tree roots as the trees were like... Yeah, hobbits and tried to eat them. Having read those first few chapters, I don't know if I can blame the trees. I was very... Uh, hesitant to continue onwards with this book around this part of the story. I remember being like, I've been raised on some very dark fantasy, and this is a lot of whimsy, and it might be more whimsy than I can stomach. I jokingly said to someone, I'm gonna need one of these hobbits to get stepped on and, and die, you know, gruesomely for me to be invested in this story. <laughs> Having spent a little more time with the hobbits, I'm now very glad that did not happen. And yes, I despise Tom Bombadil to begin with. He sang way too much, and listening to the audiobook version, of course, Andy Serkis belted out every single Tom Bombadil song, some of which contained interesting lore, most of which did not. Actually, I, I feel like I've probably just upset some Lord of the Rings fans. There's probably interesting lore in all of his songs, but it felt like a lot of them was about the countryside. And yes, epic fantasy writers all have their hang-ups that kill the pacing of a story for... Uh, George R. R. Martin, its descriptions of food. For Robert Jordan, its descriptions of clothing and fashion. And for J.R.R. R. Tolkien, its lengthy descriptions about the countryside. I don't need to be able to paint a picture of the countryside. You can just tell me they're going through the countryside and it looks a bit yellowy and dying or it's very lush and green and there's butterflies and my, my brain will usually fill in the rest. He's also very concerned with letting us know how the hobbits feel about oh, when is it time to stop and take a break and have a meal? And what is it like when they go to sleep this time? The amount of descriptions there are in this book of the hobbits bedding down and going to sleep is, I mean, it's written well, like, the prose is good, but I don't need, I don't need to know their bedtime routine every night. And I love how Tom Bombadil saves them from those trees that are trying to eat them, then gives them lots of advice about the world and what to avoid and stuff, and then gives them a little, kind of a summoning song, so that he can show up and save them if needed. And then, after they spend some time with him, he, he lets them go on their merry way, and they immediately <laughs> stumble into danger and almost get themselves killed by a Barrow White, and immediately have to summon Tom Bombadil, who is like... Okay, guess I'm coming with you for a little way then. By the way, by the by the end of Tom Bombadil segments, I had grown to like the man. I like that he's basically a god of whimsy. I mean, he's not a god of whimsy, but you get the impression. I think at some point in Rivendell, they say that he's like one of the first creatures to have ever existed, which is cool. 
Uh, Lord of the Rings is full of ancient creatures who have seen multiple ages come and pass, and I love that. Um, and yeah, Tom Bombadil is no exception. Tolkien's so good at making names that are fun to say. Bilbo Baggins, Tom Bombadil, Peregrine Took, Fool of a Took. I will say, before we get past the slower parts of the story, uh, towards the first half of the book, there were still really good parts that caught my attention, most notably... Any conversation with Gandalf was just a banger. And it might partially be Andy Serkis' performance as these characters in the audiobook, but also just Gandalf just spitting out some damn cool lore about the world and, like, the One Ring and its power and, you know, where it came from and Mordor and Sauron and all that stuff. So cool. I love all of it. Now, for the second half of the book... Uh, also known as book two. <laughs> it's kind of weird the way it's structured. When we get to Rivendell and then I think this book basically really finds its footing, really becomes a good book when the fellowship is formed because then we have this diverse cast of characters. It's not just all hobbits and whimsy and I like the hobbits more for who they are among the party of you know, you've got the two humans, uh, you've got Aragorn and Boromir, who themselves are very different people, very different creatures. Uh, you've got the elf in Legolas, you've got the dwarf in Gimli. Obviously, Gandalf is still there. It just makes for more fun conversations and opportunities for lore and stuff like that. You know, how the world responds to this group of characters. You see that the elves are very... Uh, they don't like Gimli on site because the dwarves, when they mined too deep in Moria and unearthed that ancient evil, that ancient evil then went on to, like, terrorise the elves. And the elves have always been a bit like, God damn it, dwarves, could you just have, like, let it be? Moria, by the way, is the pinnacle of this book, with Gandalf facing down the Balrog. I think that's probably a common thought amongst people talking about Fellowship of the Ring, but... I am fascinated by the law of Moria and, like, the evils that they unearthed. I don't know if there's any law connecting them to Sauron and, like, his element of darkness and where he came from. I also know there's law about Sauron, the Dark Lord, and how he wasn't always the Dark Lord. There was a Dark Lord before him and he was kind of, like, he got corrupted and kind of served him. And then, yeah... There's a lot of lore for me to go and research and discover later on. It'll be cool. But, like, to me, the Balrog and the evil of Moria always felt a lot more like demons and, like, straight-up hell allegories. Uh, oh, sorry, no. No allegories in this book. Whereas, I don't know, Sauron and the orcs and, and all that seems like a different kind of evil to me. Um, I'm not quite sure where the distinction is there, but there is one in my eyes. Maybe I'm wrong. I was a little shook to learn that the original quote isn't you shall not pass, it's you cannot pass. I just, I don't know how the movie adaption was just so flagrantly different, you know? Like, honestly, is it even worth calling it Fellowship of the Ring at this point? It's so different. Also, I did find it kind of comical. Andy Circus. it wasn't meant to be comical, but Andy Circus opted for when Gandalf says, fly you fools. You know, in the movie, he's like, fly you fools. And then he falls. In... <laughs> In the book, he's like, fly, you fools, <laughs> as he falls down. <laughs> it's so cartoony. Ah, uh, rest in peace, Gandalf. We hardly knew you. He's definitely dead. Not coming back. So sad. But yeah, I like what that does for Aragorn's character, how that then places the burden of leadership on his shoulders. And, you know, he's clearly spent all of his time being a ranger, being a lone woodsman, uh, and not having to bear the burden of leadership and um i'm okay here's the thing i'm still iffy on what he's king of um like if it's a particular country in middle earth or if it's from the west because he's meant to be like this ancient human from the line of numenor now fallen all that stuff so um you know he's a lot older than the humans who exist nowadays who have much more mortal lifespans is he the king of gondor i don't know but i like that you know obviously like he hasn't had to be a leader for a long time, and obviously his character arc is him being a leader again, so that's pretty cool. I'm excited to learn more about Aragorn. I think he might be my favourite character so far. I'm not going to talk about literally each and every single element of the story, uh, but to kind of like give my overview, um, yeah, all that stuff that I just said. In regards to Frodo as the protagonist, he's very much like 
almost unwilling. Um, and I don't know, he's not my favourite protagonist ever. He fits the bill, I suppose. I do like the whole theme of, like, the burden of responsibility and the weight of the ring and its corruption versus, you know, his hobbit-like innocence and good-naturedness as a character and how that's wearing on him. Uh, it, it's it's good stuff. I'm invested. I like how there's a few times when he kind of tries to give the ring away. He's like, Gandalf, can't you have it? And Gandalf's like, look, I know I'm a great guy and all, and I'm a powerful wizard, but I would be too tempted to use it for, for what I saw to be good. And then, you know, one thing leads to another, suddenly I'm the bad guy. I think that's actually verbatim from the book. And then learning nothing at all from this, he offers it to Galadriel because she very pretty, strong elf queen lady. And <laughs> Galadriel just has zero chill and is like, yes, I will become beautiful and terrible and all this stuff. And then uh, she's like, uh, mm, actually, yeah, no, no, no. But I do like how she represents temptation and she tempts every member of the party uh when they reach oh Lothlorien I remember the name she tempts each and every member of the party for corruption like being like oh if you turn away your heart's desire could be true if you turn away from his quest etc and then kind of like accidentally build not build oh Frodo uh you know Uno reverse cards her by tempting her with possession of the ring and she's like ah well played. Although I should just add here, you know, there has been a lot said as well about how male-centric Lord of the Rings is, how few female characters there are, and the fact that the main talking female character we get in Fellowship of a Ring in Galadriel, you know, kind of exists to tempt uh, the party is a little bit like eyebrow raising, but you know... 1950s I guess. It reads more as oversight than it does overt misogyny to me but um, I'm no expert and I did not know the writer. But yeah Frodo if you could stop offering the ring to the most powerful people in the world so you don't have to deal with it that would be great. Although that is selling short you know Frodo's conscience and how he gets to those offerings and stuff. And then Boromir, of course, wants the ring for himself, or not for himself, but to use as a power against the Dark Forces, because what's interesting about this book is that you hear all about the Dark Forces amassing Sauron's armies, and you hear about all these wars which are occurring in the world, and it's all happening because this one ring. But the story doesn't focus on the epic uh, warfare, at least not yet. It focuses on the person who is trying to sneak the One Ring to the fires of Mordor to destroy it. And while I think we probably spend more time in the more traditional sense of like, oh, the armies of the light versus the armies of the shadow, you know, that traditional grand epic fantasy stuff. It's interesting how in this book, all that stuff is kind of happening in the background and Boromir kind of represents that stuff. And he's there being like, look, we could really use this ring to fight against the dark lord i almost said the dark one this is not the wheel of time and of course that would be the wrong move because the ring is too much of a corrupting influence and you know the person wielding it their sense of good and evil would be warped and etc 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 we would just end up with a new dark lord and it would all start over again and i think it's cool like people tend to look to lord of the rings as like the default this is the default epic fantasy story the one that invented the genre or subgenre of fantasy but it's not when you think about it when you look at the story for what it is how the first book doesn't concentrate on the scale of the world itself how the protagonist is unlikely in frodo it's not some human warrior going on i mean he's obviously going on a hero's journey but he's not like brave and courageous with a sword becoming stronger all the time he's not even the chosen one he just happens to have this burden placed upon him and happens to be the right person for it the lord of the rings is an interesting and unique epic fantasy story in its own right despite kind of being looked to as the the thing that everything else derives from when you think about it most epic fantasy don't have protagonists like frodo so it's still unique in its own way and i find that really fun to discover but yeah uh before we get too far away from boromir i was surprised that he was still alive by the end of this book because for anyone who has seen fellowship of the ring you know that he dies a very long slow arduous heroic death in that movie i remember watching that movie with my friend i just started to laugh and he was like why are you laughing boromir's dying this is sad and i was just like 
this feels like a parody with how long it's going on for. He keeps getting back up and running with his sword and falling again. And uh, that was an interesting scene. But yeah, going into the two towers, uh, I don't hold out much hope for Boromir's um, survival. I am excited to continue reading because I've only seen the movie, uh, The Two Towers, once. And I don't really remember it very well because of that. So the story is going to be less predictable for me from here on out. I know at some point the hobbits get taken to Isengard. Uh, I know there's a big fight at Minas Tirith, is it called? Uh, towards the end of the book. I know uh, there's Ents and they speak very slowly. Not particularly looking forward to that segment. Uh, and I remember Saruman kind of, uh, you know, chopping down the forests and entering the industrial age. Other than that, I don't really know what's going to happen in the book, if it even follows the film that closely. I mean, it would be the film following the book that closely, you know what I mean. Either way, those are my first thoughts uh, reading Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring in 2024. Hopefully there was something there. Uh, to interest you, despite me being the last person in human history to have ever read the book, at least uh, probably as of a time of seconds after finishing it, then probably someone else finished it shortly after me, you know how it goes. All the same, it's been talked about to death, so hopefully my perspective was at least interesting. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to read The Two Towers directly next. It didn't take me too long to read Fellowship of the Ring, all things uh, said and done, but I might take a small break and read Elantris by Brandon Sanderson purely because I'm waiting on my next Audible credit <laughs> and that one comes through for subscriptions. So I might do that instead. We'll see. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. <laughs>